His judgments, verse two, are true and just. Nobody in all of the universe is going to say, why did you let them off the hook? Tonight we are in Revelation chapter 19, verse 1 down through verse 5. Uh, I wanted to make sure we have plenty of time uh, next week to address that next section about the marriage supper of the Lamb and what it means to be invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And tonight's text will be sufficient for us, verse 1 through verse 5. Some of you may remember this especially uh, our, more, our more aged uh, members, you will remember this. Um, in 2015, there was a man by the name of Oscar Greening, Oscar Greening, who was handed down a verdict, verdict a conviction um, for being an accomplice in over 300,000 murders. Um, he was known as the accountant of Auschwitz. He was uh, a bookkeeper. He had a desk job there in that Nazi death camp that saw more than 300,000 human souls, people made in the image of God. He saw them gassed in those makeshift gas chambers that were nothing more than renovated showers. And they would take the, those dead bodies out and they would incinerate them there in the furnace. And Oscar Greening was 94 years old when he finally came to trial. And he was convicted guilty on all 300,000 counts of accomplice to murder. When we read of things like that, when that event happened, you ask yourself the question, why bring a man who's 94 years old, whatever sentence you give him, it's not like he's going to experience that very long. It would seem likely that he would perish uh, in just a few years. Most people don't live to be that old as it is. But uh, he was 94 years old when he was convicted. And we ask ourselves, why? Why even take the man to trial? What's so important about it? Justice is important about it. Justice. To see those wrongs righted as good as a human being can do, it ought to be done. And we as human beings, and specifically as Christians, understanding to a degree the justice of God, that the wages of sin is death. We understand that every right or every wrong must be righted. And we understand what Jesus did for us on the cross. He didn't just say, well, I'll just forgive you of your sins. It's okay. We're cool. He didn't do that. He doesn't sweep anybody's sins under the rug. No, justice has to be served. That's what it means for God to be a good God. God's goodness is not goodness in the sense of us thinking about Santa Claus. He's good. He, he threatens people with coal, but in the end, he really gives everybody presents. So it was like God is good all the time, and all the time God is good. That's not, that's not the sense in Scripture of God's goodness. God's goodness means he rights every wrong. He gives justice for everyone who has been wronged. And specifically, God gives justice to his elect. God gives justice to his elect. I want you to see this truth from the text because it's, it's right here in this and this will emerge as we go through it. But if you write one thing down, write this one sentence down. I believe it'll be up on the board here in just a second. Because God gives justice to his elect, we should join with heaven in praising his name. Because God gives justice to his elect, we should join with heaven in praising his name. Seems like a, a simple enough truth, but I want you to think of every time that you have been wronged because of your faith in Jesus. Indeed, some people have been wronged more than others for their faith in the name of Jesus. Some people, like we looked at Rachel Scott on Sunday there in Columbine, she was very much so wronged for the name of Jesus. Our brothers and sisters over the sea that are being murdered and martyred for their testimony in the name of Jesus, they are wronged. Those priests 
there in Israel that were cut down by Saul and his men because they were chasing down David. Those men were wronged. When John the Baptist was beheaded at the request of a dancer, John was wronged. And we still live in a day where John is still wronged. Rachel Scott is still wronged. People who've given their lives for the name of Jesus, they are still wronged. And their blood, just as the blood of Abel, who was murdered by Cain, his brother, because his sacrifice was righteous, even still the blood of Abel, the blood of John, the blood of Rachel Scott, and the blood of all of the martyrs who have given their life in the name of Christ, all of them, their blood still cries out to God. We have this wonderful truth that God will give justice to his elect. And it's not human justice. It's godly justice. This is full. This is complete. You see, we can only as human beings sentence people for a time period unto death. But God is the one whom the gospels say is able to destroy both soul and body. God is able to punish someone for eternity. So let's look at our text this evening. Revelation chapter 19, it says in verse 1, After this, I heard what seemed to be the loud voice of a great multitude in heaven. What was this that we are speaking of after this? You remember in Revelation 17, uh, we saw that illustration there of the great prostitute, Babylon the Great, the city that will rule, that will have domain over all the nations here in the end of days. That city is not identified by any other name than Babylon the Great. We don't know exactly who she might be. She may be in existence now. She may not. She may come into existence before too long. But we know that when that that city comes along, that city is characterized by idolatry, by spiritual adultery, spiritual immorality. And she is an exporter of paganism, of licentiousness, which essentially means that you have a license to do whatever you want. Whatever's right for you is right for you. Whatever's right for me is right for me. That is licentiousness. She is an exporter of all sorts of sensuality, saying, whatever your body says is good. Go ahead and have your fill and then some in excess. She's an exporter of everything that is godless, everything that is unrighteous. And in fact, chiefly, she is an exporter of persecution and destruction of the saints of God. That mindset that says... Christians ought not be able to speak about Jesus in the public sphere, and if they do, we will silence them. If they do, we will put them to death. That mindset is the mindset of Babylon. That mindset is the, the ruling or prevailing um, ideal that governs the whole world as it comes to an end. And in chapter 17 of Revelation, that's what you see. That as that mindset spewing out of that central city in the end of days, as it spreads over all of the earth, it says that eventually there are 10 kings that come along, 10 kingdoms, and they've had enough. And they hand their power over to the beast. They hand their power over to the Antichrist. And they join up together in an alliance. And they turn on Babylon in the end. And in one single day, everything that that city has exported, everything that that city has trusted in is laid waste in a single day. Though she said of herself, I sit as queen. I am no widow. I will never mourn. And in chapter 18, her destruction is foretold. It is declared prophetically that that day is sure to come. And everything that that mindset, everything that that city, everything that secular humanity trusts in, it all comes to naught. It all comes to failure there in the end. And so we're told about that in Revelation chapter 18. And we're told that because these things come to an end, because God has set a day to destroy Babylon, what's that cry there in chapter 18? 
He says, come out of her, my people. Come out of her now before that day comes. That's why last week when we looked at Revelation 18, we talked about how the time for holiness is now. Time for holiness is not when I get older and it's time to start getting serious about God. No, the time for holiness is now. Because when God's judgment comes, it will come in a single day. And there's no more time to repent at that point. So what's the reaction of heaven to this? What is the reaction to heaven to the destruction of Babylon the Great, to God's justice being rained down here on the earth? After this, it says in verse 1 of 19, I heard what seemed to be the loud voice, megaphone is the literal translation there, I heard a megaphone of a great multitude in heaven crying out. They are singing so loud that it has become a chant. It has become a cry, almost a scream at the top of their lungs. And listen to what they say. They say, hallelujah. Are the people in heaven Baptists? I don't I don't know. They seem to be quite loud and not so subdued, but they say, hallelujah. That word is a Hebrew word. It's a transliteration of two Hebrew words that are smushed together there. Hallel means praise and Yah means Yahweh. It's short for Yahweh or Jah or Jehovah. And so it literally means praise Jehovah. Praise God, praise Yahweh. The reaction of heaven to the justice of God poured out on Babylon is to say, praise God. Praise Yahweh, the sovereign Lord. That's what that name means. He is sovereign over all things. Praise God for raining down justice on the exporter of immorality. Hallelujah salvation and glory and power belong to our God. Three things there that are enumerated that belong to our God. Salvation. In what sense does salvation belong to our God? Salvation belongs to our God in two ways. In two ways. When we talk about salvation, obviously we are talking about the redemption from sins and death that comes through Jesus. Jesus died on a cross. That's why we have a cross here at the center of our sanctuary because we are thinking about the salvation that God has brought to us that he accomplished through Jesus there on the cross. God didn't sweep our sins under the rug. He nailed them up on a cross in the person of his son Jesus. And he had his son put to death as a criminal though he was without sin. And God raised him up from the dead three days later, giving forgiveness of sins and resurrection from the dead to any person who calls on the name of the Lord. That is salvation. That's the gospel for us. That is the good news. But if we think that salvation ends there, we are, we are only seeing half of the picture. The salvation of God is not just the redemption of sinful man unto glory. The salvation of God is eternal. It also includes not just the wiping away of sins and, and making you holy. It also includes the destruction of evil, of all evil forevermore. You are saved from this world in the end. Our salvation isn't just something that we can look back on and say, I'm just so thankful that God saved me. It's something I can look at to now and I can look at in the future and say, God is saving me. God will save me. God has always saved me. God's salvation to us is all encompassing. His salvation to us, towards us, is longer lasting than our marriages. It's longer lasting than our church buildings, than our jobs, than our educations, than our 401ks. God's salvation is unto eternity eternity. And so heaven cries out on a megaphone. Salvation belongs to our God, but not only salvation, it says salvation and glory. That's the word doxa, dotsa. It's where we get our word doxology. You remember the song do doxology, praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above and say that 
<laughs> Praise him above all heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. When we talk about the, the glory of God, we are talking about his brightness. We're talking about his radiance. We're talking about the praise that is due his name, all praise and honor are due him from heavenly hosts above, from people who have been redeemed from the earth. All the praise goes to him. And it says not only salvation, not only glory, but it says, and power belong to our God. Power belong to our God. When we think about the power of God. We need to think more, uh, more than just God's power over our circumstances. A lot of times when we think about God's power, we, we look down at our individual lives and we think God is powerful over my circumstance. And indeed, God is powerful over our circumstance. God can move people. God can move businesses. God can do this and that. He can do all of those things. But God's power is so much more encompassing than that. It's so much more global and cosmic than that. In my Bible reading this morning, uh, Psalm 27 was one of the chapters that I read. Here's a portion out of Psalm 27 that speaks to the power of God as it relates to just his voice. Psalm 27, verse 7 through 10. The voice of the Lord flashes forth fire a flame. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord makes the deer give birth and strips the forest bare. And in his temple all cry, glory. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord sits enthroned as king forever. God's power is sovereign, meaning there is nothing to compare it to. There is nothing to withstand it. I love the, the juxtaposition of those two ideas. The voice of the Lord strips the forest bare, rips all the bark and the limbs and the leaves off of even the cedars of Lebanon. And at the same time, the voice of the Lord causes that gentle deer to give birth. The Lord's power is all-encompassing. And so the people of heaven, this great multitude of heaven, they praise God for his all-encompassing, all-sovereign power insofar in this sense as it relates to the destruction of Babylon. All of those nations joined together that had persecuted the saints, that had put them to death, that had exported their idolatry and their godlessness and their God-hating mindset, God has destroyed them. Look at verse 2. He explains this. For his judgments are true and just. For he has judged the great prostitute. It's Babylon the great. Who corrupted the earth with her immorality and has avenged on her the blood of his servants. Heaven rejoices in Revelation 19 because God has righted every wrong. Because God has finally called to account the blood of righteous Abel that calls out from the ground from those earliest chapters of human history. The blood of John calling out from the ground, still dripping from Herod's axe that beheaded him. The blood of Rachel Scott still there on that cafeteria floor. God makes it right in this day. And heaven absolutely celebrates because God has given them vengeance. God has avenged their blood. When we think about the justice of God, God's justice given over to his elect, I want us to remember this. I want us to remember that we need to leave vengeance to God. We need to leave vengeance to God. There are some times that you need, you need to take up for yourself. You need to stand up for yourself, for sure. I'm not saying you need to be a, a doormat or a rug that people walk all over. That's not the idea of turning the other cheek or letting God have his vengeance. But when you are wronged for the name of Jesus, you don't need to reach out for retaliation. You don't need to reach out to make it right. God will make it right. And here is a truth. Here is a truth. God's way of making it right is far more satisfactory than our way. God's way of making things right is far more satisfactory than our way. 
we can only avenge things to a certain degree. You know, if you had Oscar Greening on trial, how far could you avenge those 300,000 souls that were gassed to death in Auschwitz? You can only go so far. You know he was only given four years. God, on the other hand, when God avenges the blood of his saints, when he gives justice, he gives it how? His judgments, verse 2, are true and just. Nobody in all of the universe is going to say, why did you let them off the hook? They're judged in truth. They're judged in justice. The Apostle Paul taught this truth to the Roman Christians as he wrote to them. And think of Paul's day when he wrote this in Romans 12, verse 9. Paul was writing to Christians, who, some of whom would be paraded out in that Roman Colosseum, chased down and ate by lions, used as rabbits to run the trail there as the charioteers speared them and cut them down with swords. And these are the words, these are the words of the Apostle Paul to that church there in Rome. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. God's vengeance is always more satisfactory, more true, and more just than ours ever could. So we need to leave vengeance over to God. All of heaven celebrates here that God has given Babylon, God has given every persecutor, he has given them exactly what they deserve. He has burned them down. Look at verse 3. Once more they cried out. That's actually the same word, once more. It's the word for two. It's where we get our word for Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy being the second law. It says, once more they cried out, hallelujah. You know, when you're praising God, one hallelujah just won't do. When you're praising God, one song just won't do. You always need to have just one more. You're going to have to have just one more. I almost asked Eric and the praise team, could we do just one more? It didn't feel like we got it all out. It didn't feel like we said enough. And I think for eternity we'll be saying just one more, just one more, because we haven't exhausted our hallelujahs. So they say, hallelujah, what are they praising? says the smoke from her goes up forever and ever. That sounds eerily familiar, almost a direct quote, a direct citation from Re Revelation chapter 14. Remember those who had, been, who had taken up the mark of the beast in order to live in the last days with the beast, with the Antichrist, and to participate in all sorts of commerce? They take the mark of the beast. And what does it say that their punishment is? When God gets a hold of them, when God gives them justice, it says that they're going to be thrown into the lake of fire and they will be tormented day and night in the presence of the Lamb and the smoke of their torment will go up forever and ever. What's being spoken of there? Hell. And it's being spoken of as a finality of judgment, a completeness, a never-ending judgment. And that same sort of judgment is given to Babylon. It's given to those who put believers, who put followers of Christ, put them to death. They may put you to death temporarily. They may kill your body. It speaks of believers many times in the Bible as having gone to sleep. It'll say that of Stephen after he's stoned to death at the end of Acts chapter 7. It will say that Stephen went to sleep. Well, he's dead as a doornail right there, folks. Well, why is Stephen spoken of as falling asleep? Why does the Apostle Paul speak of believers there in the letters to the Thessalonians as falling asleep? And because those who have fallen asleep in Christ, those who have died in Christ, they're going to wake back up at the resurrection. It is a temporary experience. The judgment that man inflicts on man is temporary in every sense of the fashion. But the judgment that God inflicts, the death that God inflicts on a human being, and namely on those who persecute his followers, is not temporary by any means. The smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever in a place where the worm never dies, where the fire is never quenched, and where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. Once more they cried out, hallelujah, the smoke from her goes up forever and ever. 
Look at verse 4. It says, and the 24 elders and the four living creatures. Let's identify them real quick. You remember from Revelation chapter 4, as we're given a snapshot, a picture, a scene of God Almighty seated on the throne. God Almighty seated there on the throne, and around his throne there are four living creatures. It tells us in Revelation 4, 6, I'll describe those four living creatures to you real quick. It says that they are full of eyes all around in front and in back of their head. They're full of eyes. One of them, one of these living creatures around the throne looks like a lion, the other like an ox, one with the face of a man, and the other looks like an eagle that is in mid-flight. It says that they are full of wings. They have six wings, each one of them. And day and night, they never cease crying out this phrase. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. So these four living creatures who for eternity passed upon their creation... They have been crying out about the holiness, the uniqueness of God. None like him. They have been praising him. And near them, around the throne, are also these 24 elders. It says that they are clothed in garments of white, and they have crowns on them. They have Stephanos. They have victor's crowns on their heads. These elders are people who have overcome the temptations of the world. They are people who have ascended to this position around God's throne, not because of accolade in this world, not because of political power. They have ascended to that position because they have endured through suffering. And those 12, or those 24 elders, those glorified human beings, they stand around the throne of God and continually day and night, they fall down and worship and they cast their crowns down there at the feet of Jesus. So it says, and the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who was seated on the throne saying, amen. Hallelujah. You know, when you say amen in church, you're saying something biblical. When you say amen, you are saying, I agree. That's true. So be it. You're essentially saying, you know that's right. That's what these elders, that's what these four living creatures, that's what they're doing around the throne of God. They hear the multitude of those who have gone before us. Some of us will be in that multitude before Christ returns. And in that multitude, you hear this roar of praises because of the justice of God. And those 24 elders around the throne, those four creatures, living creatures who always sit there and they praise the name of God as holy. When they hear glorified human beings praising the justice of God, they turn around and they say, you know, that's right. Amen. We got to say amen to that. See how uncomfortable that makes us feel because we're Baptists? There we go. Come on. You know that's right. Here we go. Here we go. We're going to turn heavenly before too long. They say amen. And then what do they follow up with? Hallelujah. It's not enough to say it once. Not enough to say it twice. You got to say it three times. When you are praising God once, twice, three times is not enough. Seems like everybody in heaven is saying praise God at this point. God has righted every wrong. Amen. Hallelujah. And from the throne came a voice saying, praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him, small and great. Why? Why are the saints of heaven, the, the elders around the throne, the four living creatures, why are they praising God in this way at this point? Because God has given justice to his elect. You remember Jesus told a parable in Luke chapter 18 about a, a persistent widow. And she was going to an unjust ruler, an unjust judge. He's an unscrupulous man. And she went to this man and she cried out to him every day, give me justice, give me justice. And every day she went away and she did not get justice. And eventually that woman had gone to that judge enough that she wore him down. And finally he says, okay, I'll give you what you want. I will give you justice. Jesus was teaching us about the persistency of prayer and he laid this truth on us that is realized 
It's realized in Revelation 19. Luke 18, 7 through 8, Jesus says, And will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? That's talking about us. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? When we think about God giving justice to his elect, when we feel tempted to just give up before the end, just walk away because it's too hard to walk with Jesus, the cost is just too steep. When we think about that, Jesus is asking, when I come back, will I find faith on the earth? Will I find people who are trusting in the justice of God, people who are waiting for the Lord? God will not delay long in giving justice to his elect. Those who cry out to him day and night, even in heaven, it tells us in Revelation chapter 6, it tells us that even in heaven now, under the altar there in heaven, that the martyrs, those who have been slain for the name of Christ, that they cry out to him day and night, calling for justice. Finally, in Revelation 19, God makes all of these things right. So they say, praise God. Our God. That word praise is a verb. And you can see in the Greek that it is an imperative. That means it's a command. It's not an option. It's not an option for those who follow after Jesus. Notice what he said. The voice that comes from the altar, it's not God because God would have said, praise me. Maybe it's one of the four living creatures. The point is not who said this. The point is what are they saying? So they say, praise our God. Praise our God. Our. They're inclusive here. Inclusive of all those who have placed their faith in Jesus. All those who have believed in the Lord Jesus, who have given their life over to him. In Christ, you can say, he is our God. It says in Romans chapter 3 of the salvation of God that comes through faith in Jesus. Romans 3, 21 through 22. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. All who believe in Jesus can say of God the Father, you are my God, you are my father, and I am your child. And I know that God the Father will right every wrong. So the command here is given. Praise our God, all you his servants. All you his servants. Every one of us, no matter how high we rise in God's household, we are his children and we are his servants. That's the word douloi. It speaks plurally of all of us, but it simply means slave. One of our Hillcrest shirts, if you've read what it says there under it, it says Hillcrest and it says doulos. And you have a little definition there. It says slave, servant, bond servant, because you are identifying yourself to other people that you are a servant of God. You are a slave of God. You're not entitled. You are a servant of the Lord. So those who serve the Lord, he says, all you his servants, you who fear him, small and great. I'm so thankful that God includes the small people like me. I'm so glad that God includes people, little old people like us in the number that are counted there in heaven, in the number that is allowed to praise him around his throne. And why do all these people, small, great, all of them servants, All of those in the multitude of heaven, the 24 elders, the four living creatures, why do they all join in song, join in this chorus saying hallelujah, amen, praise God for his justice? They're praising him because he has righted those wrongs. One of the things that Jesus told us before he ascended into heaven as he was teaching his disciples There in the Gospels, as we have it recorded, he taught them how to pray. And one of the things I've reminded you of many times that he taught them to pray is that simple phrase, your kingdom come, your will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven. As Christians, we ought to be praying for that day of justice. We ought to be longing for that day that every person who has lost their, ne- lost their life, every person who has lost their home, lost their finances, lost anything, lost a child, lost a spouse because of the name of Christ, that will all be made right in the end. Because God gives justice to his elect, we should join with heaven in praising his name. Would you all pray with me?